A fun fact. There were more copper mines operating in Michigan in 4000 BC than there are today. Actually, a lot more. Where today there is one mine producing copper and nickel in the Upper Peninsula, during the period from about 4000 BC, maybe earlier to 1000 BC, copper mining was the region's major industry and produced its principal export commodity. Over that time, the early Native American groups belonging to what archaeologists call the Old Copper Complex operated more than 5,000 individual copper mines in the Great Lakes area. The ancient people were hunters, gatherers, and fishermen who moved around the region with the seasons and the wildlife. As they moved and worked, they used any material that was available to make arrowheads, fish hooks, harpoons, spear points, and tools like awls and adzes. Early on, these were mostly made out of materials like stone and antler, but sometimes starting around 6500 BC, a new material joined their repertoire. For the next five millennia, copper would be just as important. Eventually, it would give its name to their civilization as we know it. And the people themselves would be among the first to mine and work copper anywhere in the world. They would be the only known society around the globe to develop copper metallurgy before they settled down to agriculture. But given where they lived, that was only to be expected. The area around the Great Lakes, and especially Wisconsin and Michigan's Upper Peninsula, is home to the world's largest known concentration of what is called native copper. In most places in the world, copper forms minerals in which the copper atoms are bonded to oxygen or to sulfur. But in native copper, copper is the mineral, with no other elements. And that saves a step. You don't have to smelt copper to drive off the oxygen or the sulfur. You can just pick up a lump of metal and start hammering it into shape, at least if you can pick it up. Some of the lumps, like the famous Antonagon copper boulder, were over three feet long and wide and tipped the scales at 3,700 plus pounds of solid copper. Later miners would tell tales of lumps of copper the size of a bus, too big to pull out of a mine. That would make them about the size of some of the fish my grandfather allegedly almost caught, and probably just as real. But there is plenty of copper around the area, and at first the people of the old copper complex probably picked up smaller bits of copper just lying on the surface. But as the years wore on, they learned how to recognize the telltale signs of copper in the rocks. In the case of the Michigan deposits, one of the best signs was actually a distinctive hard mineral called epidote. Epidote itself contains not a gram of copper, but it's one of the most distinctive examples of what geologists call an alteration mineral. The processes that formed the native copper deposits also caused fundamental changes in the mineral content of the rocks around the deposits. Some minerals were dissolved away and others, like the epidote, were added to the rock along with hefty doses of native copper. Geologists call this process hydrothermal alteration, and they like it because it makes their lives much easier. Ore deposits are usually small, so prospecting for them is like looking for a needle in a haystack. In contrast, the hydrothermal alteration processes spread around a much larger area outside the deposit as well as in it, making the exploration process more like looking for a javelin in a haystack. Still not easy, but a lot better than just trying to find the small deposit itself. Writing would not be around for several thousand more years, but we can tell from the locations they dug mines at that the people of the old copper complex were looking in the rocks for epidote and other traces of this hydrothermal alteration. Where they found them, they began mining for copper. The first step was to break up rock with hammer stones made from smooth, heavy cobbles found on the shores of the lakes and carried inland. Some of these weighed 60 pounds and may have been mounted on thongs for easier swinging. They broke up the rock around the copper, which usually took the form of veins, sheets, and nuggets. These pieces of metal were then removed along with whatever rock stuck to them, which would soon be broken away with smaller hammer stones and then pounded into whatever shape was wanted. 
In the old copper complex, this mainly meant functional items. Right alongside stone, copper was used for arrowheads, spear points, needles, awls, and other tools and weapons. Archaeologists have found copper beads and ornaments, but rarely. The vast majority of the mined copper was put to a practical use. Nobody knows quite how much that was, but it could have been a huge amount of metal. By 1000 BC, the old copper complex people had extracted copper from at least 5,000 mines that we know of. Most of them were small, but in a land so rich in copper, size hardly mattered. Around the turn of the 20th century, a mining engineer interested in archaeology tried to figure out how much copper the ancients had extracted from a given pit in the Upper Peninsula. So he selected a plot of land about 30 feet by 16 feet, a similar size to many of the prehistoric mines. From this experimental pit, a crew of miners working entirely with hand tools managed to extract 10 tons of copper, 1,500 pounds of it in the form of a single large lump. However impressive such copper boulders were, they were not particularly useful to the ancient people. Copper is so malleable that large blocks of it could hardly be broken up into smaller sizes, with the result that examples like the Antonagon boulder were left where they were. On the other end of the spectrum, pieces could also be too small to be any good. While the hammering techniques produced some quite sophisticated articles, all of the working took place at room temperature, without the heating or forging that would have been necessary to join smaller pieces of copper together. So the ancient miners focused instead on the medium-sized pieces of copper that they mined. Once mined and hammered, the copper would be made into useful tools and weapons and occasionally ornaments. Some of the artifacts were buried with the dead, so there may also have been ceremonial uses. In later days, the historical Iroquois of the region prized copper as a spiritual restorative and associated it with the underwater panther of legend. The people of the old copper complex may or may not have had similar beliefs. Most of their surviving copper artifacts show enough wear and tear to indicate heavy use. But it was certainly a trade good. Practical copper items from the mines near the Great Lakes are known as far away as Alabama, almost a thousand miles south. Despite its wide-ranging popularity, copper never replaced stone in the Great Lakes region as it did in other parts of the world. As a matter of fact, the opposite happened. From around 1000 BC forward, copper tools and weapons gradually fell out of favor among the people of the old copper complex. While copper would continue to be used on a small scale for beads and ornaments, the number of copper tools and weapons diminished. Old ancestral mining sites abandoned, became overgrown and forgotten. Why did the early Native Americans around the Great Lakes abandon copper in favor of stone when most societies around the world were making the opposite choice? Archaeologists puzzling over this question have suggested that perhaps the restriction of copper to purely ornamental uses reflects the emergence of a wealthy elite as the population of the old copper complex grew. An elite group could have made copper into a status symbol and forbidden its use to everyone else. But more recently, archaeological experiments have suggested that the switch from copper to stone may have been quite simply the practical choice in that particular regional context. Copper is more lustrous and prettier than most stones, so it's the practical choice for ornaments. But arrowheads, fish hooks, and adzes are a different story. Copper blades and points are somewhat more durable than their stone equivalents, but are actually heavier, softer, and less sharp, besides being more difficult to produce. In practical hunting or fighting applications, that means that copper is little better than stone, and sometimes worse. The usual solution to this problem, however, was not available in the Great Lakes region because of the geology. Around the world, most copper-using civilizations began to alloy copper with arsenic to create an arsenic bronze. At first, this happened by accident, since most copper ores in other parts of the world contained a good bit of arsenic, some of which would make its way into the metal when smelted. 
That cures the mechanical problems associated with pure copper, yielding a hard, strong, easily castable bronze metal unquestionably superior to stone. Eventually, the people of the Andes, Mesoamerica, Mesopotamia, and other regions would start making arsenic and other bronzes on purpose. Most of them would slowly abandon stone and start making tools and weapons from bronze. But around the ancient Great Lakes, there was no smelting and there were no arsenic-bearing copper minerals. With pure copper lying on the ground for the taking, it was never necessary to develop smelting. And even if it had been, the ores contained no arsenic to make a bronze with. The Great Lakes native copper is naturally around 99% pure, and the main impurity element is silver, not arsenic, which does absolutely nothing to improve the mechanical qualities of the metal. Ironically, the abundance of highly pure metal ready to hand would, in the long run, spell the end of America's first major metal industry. Not for thousands of years would copper mining again equal the scale and productivity of the old copper complex.